Welcome to the Impact Players Linking Shields podcast with your host, Warren Maynard and John Beasley. Our mission is simple, inspiring men to be great husbands, fathers, and leaders by equipping them to thrive in the relationships that matter most. Hello, guys, and welcome back to another edition of the Impact Players Linking Shields podcast a podcast designed for men who want to grow to be better husbands, fathers, and leaders. The Linking Shields podcast is all about finding leaders of men who are making an impact in inspiring the hearts of other men to grow in the relationships that matter most. And I have got to tell you guys that I am absolutely thrilled. This is a thrill of a lifetime for me to be able to have Uh, the lead guitarist of one of my all-time favorite Christian rock bands. The band is Delirious. The guitarist is Stu G. And uh, we are in for a great, great treat today as we get a chance to hear his story, the story of Delirious, and what uh, God has led him to do since his time uh, hanging up the guitar from Delirious in 2009. So Stu, Thank you so much for being a part of the Linking Shields podcast, and just tell us a little bit about yourself and 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 what you're doing right now before we kind of get into your full story. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me, Warren. I really appreciate it and I love the work you're doing. So that's awesome. Um, yes. Yeah, so I live in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Uh, my wife and I and our, our daughters got two daughters. We moved over uh, in 2010. And uh, we're now citizens and uh, uh, and all that good stuff. My daughters are married and having children. So we're, we're uh, imminently becoming uh, um, a fourth time grand, uh, grandparent uh, with a grandson due tomorrow. <laughs> so wow. we shall see. Uh, but yeah, we love it here. Um, we go to Hope UC Church in uh, Thompson Station here with Dustin Smith and um, yeah, and so work-wise, what I do now is that I tour live with Michael W. Smith. Uh, so whenever he does a tour, I'm his guitar player, and um, I love doing that. And then um, in the in the bits in between, you know, I write songs, I play guitar for different people um, in the studio, or whatever. Um, and I have a project called the Beatitudes Project, which we'll talk about in a little while. And um, I am also I'm creating a resource for musicians and guitar players and worship teams um, that is a practical guide to how I play guitar and how I've done my thing. But at the same time, it's going to each module is going to have a formational element, like a spiritual formation element. And I'll, I'll be pulling from the Beatitudes project in that. But um, yeah, you know, I, my uh, the season that I'm in right now and for the foreseeable future as far as i know is one of like i'm really hungry to pass on what i've learned uh from a lifetime of um ministry and playing you know music um and uh so um just trying to you know figure what that out what that looks like also still being a father and a grandfather and having to pay the bills. So I'm like, uh, (laughs) just trying to to figure all that out. Absolutely. And I mean, that's to me what an impact player is all about. You know, our mission is inspiring men to be great husbands, fathers, and leaders by equipping them to thrive in the relationships that matter most. And, you know, we know that you can have all the, the success in the world in your career, but if you don't have that success at home and more importantly, that set success with the Lord, um, you're, you're never going to be fully satisfied. And so yeah. I'd love to go back into mm-hmm. the story a little bit. You know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're a British man who's transferred over to the United States, but your origin of course is in England yes. and, and England uh, is certainly um, a country that has a religious history, but mm-hmm. is not, um, you know, a place right now where there is a strong, a strong, you know, foundation of, uh, you know, Christianity, at least statistically. So how did you come to know the Lord to, to discover 
music and guitar? And then how did all that culminate in becoming a part of one of the greatest Christian rock bands of all time? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. So um, my parents, uh, like when I uh, when I was growing up, they were part of a uh, a small Baptist church, and um, you know the UK is a little bit different to uh, to what it's like in America. There's not such a well, certainly in the Bible Belt here in Tennessee, you know, there's not such a religious kind of like overtone or atmosphere in the UK. Um, but what there is in the UK is lots of like pockets of like what I can only describe as revival. You know, it's kind of uh, there's some really strong believers running some amazing churches in the UK. And uh, um, anyway, growing up, I didn't know about that side of things. And this, you know, I was in like a little religious church and um, didn't didn't really mean that much to me. So um, I left school. I started an apprenticeship with uh, with a, a company to become an electrician. Um, I met my wife, uh, my well, who was going to be my future wife, um, and uh, and we got engaged. And then um, I'm kind of scooting a load of information here, but um, we were invited to London because I was I just started playing guitar when I was 16, and um, uh, and I was a big fan of a guitar player from America called Phil Kagi. Uh, um, and Phil is a Christian and has made some amazing music over the years. One of the best guitar players in the world, without a doubt. Um, and um, and uh, someone had given me a record of his and I heard that he was coming to London. And so uh, we had some family members that were running a church in London and it was kind of like, the family kind of like were a little bit arm's length from their church life because they spoke in tongues, raised their hands and, uh, you know, um, heard from the Lord, you know, so, um, and so, um, uh, we decided to go and stay with them. They were, and, um, and go to this concert. Well, the concert turned out that it turned out that there was an evangelist there and he spoke and both my wife and I, unknown to each other we wanted to go forward you know and like give our lives to the lord but we just did it in our seats not wanting to tell each other right <laughs> and um uh and it wasn't until like a week later that that we talk, talked about it and said you know uh i gave my life to jesus and and uh so anyway that was awesome that that happened at the same time so not long after that i was still an electrician my wife was a bank clerk and our friends in London, we used to go to London to church um, like all the time. We used to drive there on a Sunday, two hours from where we lived, uh, just to be around that environment because we loved it so much. And it wasn't long before they um, said, Stu and Karen, why don't you, you know, leave your jobs, sell your house, why don't you come and live with us in London and be part of the church? Um, like we'll, we'll teach you how to lead worship and um, – you know, you can travel with us and, um, and minister with us and kind of get discipled really. Like we were very early twenties mm -hmm. and, um, and so in the end, that's what we did. And we moved to London and traveled with them. We were living with them for about six, seven years. Uh, we helped plant a church in Belgium. Um, at the same, you know, for one year we lived in Belgium and then I had a band and we moved back to London and like we're in the church there and playing around the rock clubs and, um, and Christian festivals and stuff like that. And it was towards the end of the time that we lived in London, um, that we were playing a festival somewhere, my band. And, um, I had started to work with a producer called Andy Piercy. Now, Andy Piercy, at the time was the worship director of Holy Trinity Brompton mm -hmm. uh, in London. But um, he had been in a band called After the Fire and they had a massive hit in America, actually, uh, mm -hmm. Doc Commissar. Um, and um, so he was helping me like produce the band that I was a part of. And he told me about this young guy called Martin Smith, who was a sound engineer um, in a studio down on the South Coast. And 
And so I, I kind of like started to hear about what was happening down there. And, um, and Andy was helping Martin like produce his songs. And so, um, then one thing led to another and I, um, I was playing at a festival and, and I saw, uh, and I met Martin and a guy called Tim there who Tim was a keyboard player in Delirious. And, um, you know, Delirious didn't exist at this time. This was like way in the future, but, uh, so they, they were aware of who I was and, you know, running around, jumping up and down, playing guitar. And, um, I had the opportunity to play with a couple of people, uh, in the worship world. One was Noel Richards, worship leader from the UK, mm. um, who went on to have an event called champion of the world at Wembley stadium. Mm. Um, and that was amazing. Like, uh, a couple of years I, I played with him and we led worship around the country and over Europe. And then, um, I also had an opportunity to work with American worship leader called Kevin Prosh. And, um, Kevin was coming out of the vineyard at the time in Anaheim and, uh, um, incredibly prophetic, uh, guy and was amazing musically. And so he was really encouraging, uh, me and Martin and, and like the young guys in the UK, uh, that, that, uh, to, you know, give God our worship with, um, the music that we loved. Uh, we don't have to sound, uh, religious or, um, you know, old fashioned. And so, so that's really what kind of inspired us to, um, to take our influences and, and, and kind of create music that we wanted to worship with. So, um, Noel Richards, who I mentioned earlier, he had a forum in London for worship leaders and musicians, and that met like once a month. And so I got to know Martin and Tim there. Um, and they invited me down because they'd just started an event called cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And that was a worship night for, um, for kids in the church, like youth in the church. Mm -hmm. And it started with 70 children or not children. It started with 70 kids in a, um, in a school drama hall. And, um, we quickly, quickly outgrew that hall. Um, but so I went down there, I went back home and I said to my wife, Karen, I, I said, there's something going on here. Um, you know, we should go down together next time. We went down together and it wasn't long before we decided to move down because, um, you know, bear in mind that I was a worship leader and, uh, uh like a d director of worship for three congregations. And I had to give that up and go back to being an electrician just for uh, a few years. But, um, but we wanted to be around what was happening at that youth event called cutting edge, because there was something drawing us to it, you know, and, and we, we loved that raw expression of worship that, that was coming out. So, um, so yeah, we, we went down and joined Martin and Tim and Stu and, um, and, and were part of the church. Um, and once a month we'd, we'd have these, uh, these events and they, they were growing really fast. Like people from all across the South coast would start to come. And so we ended up like maxing out the biggest venue that we could find in, in our hometown, which was about 13 or 1400 people. And so what we did was that once a year we would, we lived on, on a seaside town in a seaside town called Little Hampton. And, um, that has a, this huge green that's right, right by the beach. And so once a year we'd, um, hire some flatbed trucks and, you know, so get permission from the police and all that and, and have an outdoor event. And, uh, we had 10,000 people show up. Uh, that was a police estimate. Uh, and this was all like to worship God and like listen to music. And, um, and, uh, I remember Pete Gregg, who runs 24 seven prayer. Um, he was there, uh, and, and preaching and we were baptizing people like there and then, and it was just really exciting. You know, uh, those, those days were really exciting. And so Martin at the time <clears throat> was writing most of the songs for that cutting edge event. And he had this one, uh, did you feel the mountains tremble? Mm -hmm. And I remember one night, the first time that we played that one, um, 
that's the only song that we played for about 45 minutes, you know, and we'd just be flowing in and out. And, you know, but this thing about open up the doors and let the music play, um, mm. you know, the idea that we were encouraging ourselves and people to not, uh, not leave what we've got here uh, inside the four walls of the church, but to kind of like break it open and, and take it out um, into the towns, into the, into our workplaces, into our schools, colleges, whatever we did. And we thought that what we would do <clears throat> is we wanted to see our songs and our music in the high street, you know, at the HMV stores or in the Virgin music stores, you know, in the UK, there's not a huge Christian music industry. Yeah. And uh, so to be legit, you just have to be out there with U2 and Radiohead and Muse and everyone else, you know, um, and so um so that's what we did we started to release singles and and then um you know martin had an accident car crash and uh, was in hospital and he was like i feel like i've been given a second chance should we just give our jobs up and go full time and so we all decided to do that and we became delirious at that point wow um uh, we, when we decided to go full time. So um, now Delirious was a, an unusual outfit because we weren't signed to anyone. We uh, had started to release these six, five or six track EPs um, uh, on cassette. And, you know, we made 250 and sold them. And then that paid for the next 250 and we sold them. And then that paid for the next recording. And so uh, what we were doing was starting a record label and we didn't know it. And mm -hmm. so, um, but what that also meant was that, you know, so we were making like four pounds per cassette tape. Um, and if we'd signed to a record label, we'd have made 92 pence or something, you know? So, um, uh, so we never did like give our stuff away. We just created our own record label, our own publishing and our own distribution. And, um, and then we got people from the, mainstream industry to come and run it with us. Um, famously a guy called Tony Pototo, who's, um, uh, who's living over here now, but, um, yeah, so, uh, we had this vision for music that was, that we could use for worship, but that was good enough to be on the radio and out in the high street. And, you know, in our career, we ended up with five top 20 hits in the UK and the number two in Germany and, uh, we played Glastonbury Festival and a number of mainstream festivals across the uh, across Europe. We toured with Bon Jovi. Yes. We, we we toured with Brian Adams um, and um, uh, we did a gig with Muse in New York uh, when they were starting. And, you know, so uh, we had a lot of fun. But, you know, the thing is with us is that like we wanted to make music that was good enough to be on the radio. But if you, you know, cut us open, like we would bleed worship, like, um, uh, that was in our, so, so as many as, you know, we might've deviated a couple of times and, you know, tried to do some radio stuff or rock stuff, you know, we always would come back to like a record, like world service and have songs like majesty or rain down and stuff like that. So, uh, we traveled the world. We were going for, uh, including the cutting edge years, um, 17 years and, um, um, and then, um, we finished in 2009 and, you know, we had an incredible run really, and, uh, uh, absolutely love it. And I, and I miss it to this day. I think that, um, we had such a vision, um, and a mission like to not separate, uh, praise and worship from good music. You know, we were just trying to like do the one thing like make music and uh, have it all sit on the same record and uh to the best of our ability and um and but you know the same songs that we would sing on a sunday we were singing in a stadium with bon jovi you know so um uh we, we did our best to do that and uh to varying degrees of success but we had an amazing career and it it brought us to america and around the world you know my passport, uh, when, when I had, when I applied for my green card, first of all, 
you know, I had to go back over um, uh, 10 years of travel uh, to let the uh, US immigration know how many countries I'd been in, you know, and uh, it was almost 50. So, uh, you know, we'd, we'd done a bit of traveling. Welcome to Impact Players, where we inspire men to be great husbands, fathers, and leaders by equipping them to thrive in the relationships that matter most. Are you asking yourself, how do I become a better man? How can I grow as a husband and father? Can I succeed both at work and at home? We believe the answer is yes. Impact Players provides rock-solid answers and practical tools for men who want to improve in every area of life. Whether you're single, married, a new dad, or a grandfather, our men's groups, leadership training, and resources will help you thrive. Recent studies show men are struggling more than ever. That's why Impact Players is here. We offer cohorts where you can connect with real men like you, courses with actionable steps, and a nationwide community dedicated to winning at home and at work. Join our online community today and access a wealth of materials designed for your growth. Transform your life, impact your family, business, and community. Ready to get started? Visit impactplayers.org now. Be the man you are destined to be with Impact Players. Well, yeah, and I, I want to step in here just to, to share, you know, for me, um, uh, I'm 49 now. And so when, when Delirious kind of came into my life, I was a youth pastor. At the yeah. time, I was about uh, 22 years old. And, um, you know, it, the, the term that you guys have there, the cutting edge, was really so appropriate because I remember being in this amazing season where we were seeing the the whole context of worship begin to be transformed and you know Chris Tomlin was just getting started uh, we were just starting to hear about Matt Redman um you know Vineyard and Maranatha were kind of the predecessors to that yeah um but but like you know this the the youth like the young people were the ones that were ushering in this new age of of worship for the church and you know and and so when i heard cutting edge and then when king of fools was released and that song history makers came out yeah i mean Stu, it it was like a life anthem for me you know it was like this is what i want to to be about it and i mean the song history makers if you haven't heard it before go out and listen to it uh the absolute high point of the song is your guitar solo in, oh thank you and you know just the the epic soaring anthemic uh way that you guys put your songs together it's always kind of right at that moment when the guitar solo gets going and Martin starts bellowing out to the crowd that you just yeah. want to run through a brick wall for for Jesus and for the Lord. So for me, you know, I, I have told people for the last 20 something years that um, the, the, the worship that we enjoy today is a, di a direct derivative of what you guys brought in truly as the cutting edge. And so a lot of people may know, you know, some of those all time classics, like I could sing of your love forever. And did you feel the mountains tremble and majesty? And, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. I've got my own playlist that I play all the time. <laughs> That's great. Uh, from, from you guys. But I wonder how much of that did you fully understand was happening in you and through you at that time? I mean, I know that you had a vision to 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 bring worship and music for the Lord to the masses in a way that was was, you know, at the same level of quality. Um, but did you realize that that worship, around the world was being transformed mm. through the music that you guys were producing. No, um, we didn't realize that. No. Um, but we, 
all we knew was when we were, you know, writing these songs in small rooms, <laughs> we imagined ourselves in a, in on big stages. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was kind of like we we could imagine we were trying to write songs that uh, that you could lead in a stadium, you know, or uh, at a big festival. And but most of the time, you know, we wouldn't have presumed that we would ever see ourselves doing that. It was like, you know, it's just uh, we, we it was just our imagination, you yeah. know. <laughs> and I love I love that idea of like you know picturing the big room, you know. Yeah. You know, to me, every one of your albums is amazing. Um, but just recently, Stu, I uh, had the opportunity to drive my son to to college for the first time. He's a freshman in college. Okay. Uh, he's he's going to Grand Canyon University. So we drove about twenty four hours in the car from Seattle to to Phoenix. And yeah. my son is a a drummer. He's a yeah. musician, um, and he is a a true fan of music. And so we we listen to classic rock albums, some of the greatest music of all time. And we took yes. turns where we would listen to an album at a time. And I know we live in a world where today people don't really listen to whole albums. They listen to singles. Yeah, that's right. They've got they've got their individual songs on playlists. But yeah. we're listening to the whole album together. And so for me, I said, okay, my turn. And I chose uh, World Service. You would oh, great. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me back up. Sorry. Was it World Service? It was Glow. It was Glow. Okay. Yeah. Which Glow has those Glow interludes in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I just said, all right, we got to turn this all the way up. And I said, just imagine as you're listening to this. Being in a stadium full of, you know, 20, 30, 50, 60,000 people, because that's what I got to experience. And after we got done with that album, he goes, yeah, that that was legit. That's wow. That's really awesome music. And so that was really cool as a dad to be able to pass on, you know, that love for Delirious that I had. And for him as, you know, who considers himself to be a legit musician to to affirm the quality of the music uh, yeah. that you guys put together. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about post delirious. Yep. You guys, you stepped away in 2009 um, yep. and you've been continuing to make music on your own. You're touring, yep. like you said, with Michael W. Smith, you've also been with Carrie Job and, Cody Carnes and, um, you know, countless other musicians, Amy Grant, One Sonic Society, uh, of course, Martin Smith as well. Yeah. So, um, what are some of the things that, you know, have really kind of captured your heart and your passion over these last, you know, 15 years or so? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you know, when Delirious was, we knew that we were going to finish, um, for about a year so uh in that last year of touring whenever we were in america i would add on a couple of days come to nashville or go to la like make sure i stay connected with friends in the music industry over here and um and as it kind of happened i ended up with a song publishing deal in franklin here in tennessee with essential worship and uh my friend jason ingram and my friend paul mabry we started something called one sonic society and that was kind of like a kind of a continuation of what i was doing in delirious in some ways mm -hmm. in that you know we were trying to uh, it, it was we were three different kind of like individual musicians and producers and but we got together to make worship music you know and um and that was a really cool time um I started to work with Michael W. Smith. Um, I started to do a load of sessions and a load of um, songwriting. And, you know, we and we we moved here during that time. Mm. And uh, yeah, that really set up um, an environment of friendships and relationships um, and work that 
then led towards the conversations around the Beatitudes project, um, which I'd been thinking about for a long time. Um, I thought that it would be a delirious record, to be honest, you know. So um, the, in America here, when we were on tour, uh, we'd get, if we did a signing at the end of the night or something, uh, we'd be, all be along a table and then these youth groups would kind of file past us and say, put your favorite scripture on the on the CD and, you know, I'd always put Matthew five, six and seven, you know, the sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And over the years, it kind of narrowed down to the Beatitudes as I was kind of just reading and studying and thinking, you know, we hear about these things and um, learn about them in Sunday school. And then we just kind of forget them. You know, they're just very familiar words. And um, there was something about, you know, the poor, poor in spirit, Mm -hmm. like mourning like how can this be blessed um you know meek like the underpowered it's like what you know we know who's blessed really that's the most powerful you know mm -hmm. and, and so there's this kind of contradictory thing going on and i and i said to the guys it'd be great to make a record you know there's eight themes here um we could uh you know, like it's always a good time to sing about peacemaking showing mercy you're the poor you know this would make a great record and so um, you know, everyone thought it was a great idea and we never got around to it as delirious. And so I kind of continued that, um, that, that journey after delirious finished also with a little bit more of an understanding because the finishing of the ending of delirious kind of threw me upside down uh, for a little while, you know, I didn't really want it to, to finish at the time. And, um, it, it was kind of very difficult. And so. So I was kind of turned upside down and and kind of felt that God wasn't far away in that upside down space. And that kind of related to the Beatitudes being this upside down message mm -hmm. and that, you know, you're blessed when you're poor, you're blessed when you're grieving, you're blessed when you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness and justice. It's like, well, that's completely upside down to what we think, <laughs> you know, and what we're told. Um, and, um, we i came up with this idea that the blessing is presence that the blessing is not like you get your situation fixed quickly but that god is with you in it and um that it's divine presence in your situations and that if you want to know where god is then look for the poor and the poor in spirit look for those who mourn you know look for those who are meek and uh and hungry and thirsty and the peacemakers etc and so it very much became this this idea of presence is the blessing and then also the invitation so what i mean by that is if the if the blessing is presence god with us then the invitation is for us to be present to our own poverty of spirit to our own places where we are sad you know where we've lost things most dear to us to the places in our lives where we are aching for something you know, aching for something to be put right. So, um, so it kind of became more than a music project at that point, you know, and um, I had a call from book, a book publisher who said to me, have you ever thought about writing a book? I've heard the conversations and they're really exciting. And, and I said, no, never, never thought about it. And he said, well, would you try? And so uh, went on that journey and ended up writing a book and, you know, it became a film and it became a, uh, uh, study materials and a record and I just pulled on, on all my friendships to make the record uh, people like Michael W and Amy and Martin Smith, Amanda Cook, John Mark McMillan mm. uh, Matt Marr, like Hillsong United it just keeps kind of going on and on but uh, so that was a great time and um, and we created all these study resources and so um, I was able to every now and then get out to a church and like do a little presentation or help start off a series on the Beatitudes. And then, uh, and that was, I really loved doing that. And I thought, Oh, great. If I do this for the rest of my life, this would be amazing. I'd love to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, what happened was that COVID happened and, uh, oh, and, how and many it shut. Conversations have started out that way. Before? Right. <laughs> and it shut everything down. And so, uh, long story short, we put everything online um and 
I had to scramble to make a living all of a sudden, you know, out of music and like whatever I could do. So uh, because all the all the gigs went away, all the concerts, there was no in-person sessions. You know, it's kind of it 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 was uh, it was rough for a little while. Mm-hmm. And so um, but now I'm in this space where uh, the idea like the, the, the Beatitudes project is all up online at the Beatitudes project dot com and and it's doing its thing. But I'm still really passionate about it and it won't leave me. And so um, I'm looking forward to um, revigorating it a little bit and um, and making people aware that I'm available to come and speak, even if it's to uh, worship teams and, uh, and musicians or uh, small groups in your church, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to get out and do that stuff again. All right, guys. Well, if you're listening to this and you have any connection to a church or a worship leader, tell them to reach out and, uh, let's get Stu G, uh, in front of some folks to train them how to lead worship. I mean, how amazing of an opportunity would that be? And that's a great transition, Stu, because, you know, this this podcast is all about men. It's all about inspiring men to be great, you know, husbands, fathers, and leaders. And one of the, the knocks on men um, over the last few decades has been that, um, you know, men have been passive in the church. Um, men are not taking spiritual leadership in their home. And one of the things that we hear a lot about from men is that they um, they're not engaged in worship. So, you know, which for me, like when, when I listen to a delirious song um, as a man, I'm I'm just ready to run through a brick wall after mm-hmm. you know hearing a delirious song. But but what are some things that you might be able to share to our guys about? you know, why men need to worship and, you know, maybe what kind of an impact uh, worship can have on a man's life in particular. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of a difficult question to answer, but um, I think that, um, you know, because we, we see like in our workplaces, for instance, and in business, you see, kind of men being like completely the opposite kind of uh you know being a bulldozer and uh and it's all about um getting the most and getting the success and um you know being really engaged in you know um being a successful business leader and and you you see the fallout of of that with the way that people are treated and stuff like that and then you know in, in church it's a little bit different um I think that, um, you know, while well, just thinking about the Beatitudes, that, you know, life isn't about the most and the best and the most powerful and, you know, selling the most books and making the most money and, you know, blah, 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 that, but that God is on the side of those who, uh, who are at the end of themselves. And I think that, um, a lot of us we don't really know how to be in a in a church environment you know and uh i I think also um that you know when it says the the pure in heart are blessed right blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god i think that you know a pure heart isn't just about like a moral purity you know I, i i think that men are challenged with that enough but i think that um it's about a divided heart you know so so a pure heart is a whole heart and an undivided heart and i think that for a lot of us we've experienced something in our past you know that that causes shame or regret and um and you know, Carl Jung, a psychologist, he he said that the heart divides at that moment and you create this, you, you put down those feelings of like not wanting to experience that shame and guilt again. And so you kind of keep it down and it creates a shadow. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, I think that men are as free as they can be when they 
are, when what you see on the outside is what is on the inside and what on the inside is what is on the outside. Right. And I think that we have this kind of divided heart nature sometimes yeah. where we're not really free enough to really show what we're thinking to really kind of um, express what we're feeling and, um, and, uh, and to be free in worship, you need to be able to express those things mm. outwardly, you know? And um, so I think that that's a, uh, that is a, a thing. Um, and also I feel like, we like we need god you know i think that a lot of times we're fixers men are fixers like we take care of things yeah. you know we're the ones that are hustling looking after our families and it's on our shoulders you know and we um but we let it be on our shoulders when sometimes we need to let god be god and uh and and say not by my strength but by your spirit you know <laughs> And, um, uh, we try a lot, we, we work really hard and we do a lot of things in our own strength. And, you know, one of the things about the, what's going on, on the inside, not being on the outside, that kind of stuff is that a lot of times we can be showing that we are doing well, running hard. And on the inside, it's like, oh, I've got nothing left. Yeah. And, um, and that is a poverty of spirit. You know, like when Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, it's like Eugene Peterson, he said, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of us feel at the end of our rope a lot of the time yeah. because we don't know, especially those of us in the gig economy, um, Sometimes we don't know how we're going to pay the bills next month mm -hmm. and it's up to us to fix it. You know, whereas sometimes, and this is, I'm speaking to myself here. If I look back over 30 years, yeah. I know that God's going to have my back one way or other. Yeah. You know, there'll be, there'll be some kind of surprise work or something, you know, and, uh, um, yeah. So I think there's some worry that gets in the way. There's some anxiety that gets in the way. And there's that feeling of, I should be strong. I should be, um, uh, I should be the one to fix things. I should be the one to take care of things. And I think that all of this stuff um, kind of separates us a little bit from our need for God and our total reliance on the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. Just that there's that pride that keeps us from, being able to fully surrender ourselves to the right. role that we want and give that control to God. And yeah. that's what worship is, is, you know, when, when you see a man fully surrendered to God in worship, you see a man who is completely free. Mm. And that's, that's a, that's a powerful man is the man yeah. who's completely free and completely surrendered. And yet, you have to, like Paul says, you've got to come to the terms of your own weakness mm -hmm. in order to, you know, accept and receive the strength that comes from God above. And so, you know, it's, it's, you know, his great, his strength and his grace is sufficient for us. And that's what worship is, is that declaration of our need for God. I want to ask you one more question. Yeah. Um, going back to your story, because um, I think no matter who is listening to this story and what their career is or anything like this, I think there's a moment where almost every man will will be in a situation like what you described. And, and actually for you, it happened a few times where you basically said, we decided to surrender everything, to give up our job, our home, our, our plans, to follow God and to be a part of something that he was doing. Um, you know, you talked about moving to London to 
to to help you know start the church or be a part of the worship. Then you yeah. went to to Belgium, and yeah. then you moved out to the seacoast to mm -hmm. work with this little youth explosion that was taking place. Yeah. And then ultimately you you stepped away from uh, your your job as an uh, electrician to start Delirious. Yeah. So talk to our guys about just what it what it takes to to make that kind of a decision. Like, how were you and your wife able to do that? How were you able to come mm. to that kind of a courageous decision? And what did God prove to you as a result of your willingness to step out of the boat over and over again? Mm. Yeah, like sometimes when I look back, I, I, I kind of think, oh, they weren't always the most sensible things to do, you know. <laughs> um because we moved away from family and everything, you know, and uh, uh, so, I mean, I've got an amazing wife. She has been nothing but supportive over the years uh, of what I've been doing. But we, in all of those decisions, we've felt together on them. And I think that um, it takes a it takes a pioneering kind of spirit to to do that. You know, I think also, um, like prophetic imagination, um, of having a hunch that you can see something beyond what's immediately in front of you, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but you have a hunch. Like if we try this, this could happen, you know? And so every single time. Karen and I were together on it and we ima we could imagine uh, God doing something if we take a step. And then what was the second part of your question? Uh, Just what has God proven to you about, about, you know, taking yeah. those chances and what he does when you, when you were willing to take those chances? Yeah, I think, you know, I think because as far as we know, those intentions and those steps we took, as far as we know, they were real pure motives and intentions. Um, I think that looking back, you know, God has honored that with his faithfulness. And, you know, like we... Um, we're in a little bit of a different place to other bands that have been there because some bands go for a few years, they finish and they can all retire or, or it's just what it looks like. Right. And, um, we, we set it up differently to that. So, uh, in that, like all the money we made off delirious masters and publishing went back into the company and we paid ourselves a salary, right. um, because we wanted to have longevity and we wanted to have, our companies and we wanted to have staff and stuff like that. And that's, that's how we did it. So we weren't setting up a little nest egg for us. And I think that, um, that what I've seen God's faithfulness in provision, but for what is enough and not for what is a cushion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, no, no one's ever asked me stuff like that before. And I've not said that before, <laughs> but, um, I think that that is what I would say is that God has proven to me that he's been faithful and he's been a provider of enough. Um, yeah. And not, not an excess. Well, Stu, you truly are a history maker. And, <laughs> um, this is, this is just going to go down as such a highlight for me. Um, Thank so you. That you allowed me to take this time to talk to you, to share stories with you. I hope um, if I come out to to Nashville, I might be able to give you a buzz and and yeah. uh, and see if you're in town. But of course, uh, how can guys uh, follow you or connect with you or just learn more about what you're doing? 
Yeah, well, um, I'm on LinkedIn as Stu Gerard, and I'm on Instagram as Studio. Now, funnily enough, people think that that's a joke on Studio and Studio. It's not. It's because I'm a massive golf fan, and someone coined, someone nicknamed me Studio because my favorite golfer was Sergio Garcia. Oh, like, and th- so anyway, that stuck. So Studio at Studio on Instagram and Stu G on Facebook, um, you know, uh, and yeah, if anyone wants to, uh, in, interested in the Beatitudes project, that is simply the Beatitudes project.com. And, uh, you can see what we say about it there and you can see the e-course and, um, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, be in touch with folks. All right. Well, thank you again, Stu. Thank you, everybody, thank you. for listening to this Impact Players Leaking Shields podcast. Please share this with your friends, with other men, uh, with worship leaders in your church, pastors, whoever you think would be blessed and encouraged to hear uh, Stu, his story, uh, all the delirious fans that you may know, pass it on to them. But um, we hope that you're encouraged and inspired by another man who is fighting the good fight and uh, trying to do all that he knows to do to be the husband, father, and leader that God's called him to be. We'll look forward to catching you guys next time, but thank you again. And thanks once more, Stu. Thank you, Warren. It's really great to be with you. Thank you for joining us for the Impact Players Linking Shields podcast. We hope you're inspired to become a better husband, father, and leader. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, leave a five-star review, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Stay connected and continue your journey with us. Visit impactplayers.org for more resources and updates. Thanks for being a part of the Impact Players community. Keep thriving in the relationships that matter most.